Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for attending. We're running about five minutes late, but we give everybody five minutes on an afternoon uh, like this uh, to get here. You're all very welcome here uh, this afternoon. My name is Mark White. I'm the Director of Nursing and Midwifery Planning and Development here in the HSE Southeast. Uh, and I'm honored to be asked to open this afternoon's event, uh, which is a collaboration between the services and WIT. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to try and read my opening address without my glasses, which is a, a, a brave thing to do. But I've gone for 16 font. So if you see me doing this, uh, it's not that I'm hot or fanning myself, it's just I'm trying to focus in on, uh, on my paper. For those of you who do know me, uh, you'll know that I generally am a bullet point man, and uh, I wax lyrical around my bullet points, but in preparation for today, um, I sat down the other evening and I started to write uh, my, my thoughts and my views in relation to uh, this very topic. Um, humanity, compassion, spirituality, um, uh, and all the things around that. And about four hours later, I had about two and a half thousand words written. So it's something that I'm quite passionate about. And when I tried to then put it into bullet points, I thought, what am I doing? I'm going to read this. And uh, so um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take about 10 minutes, and then I'm going to hand over to Suzanne uh, Deniff, who is going to chair this afternoon's session. Um, all going well, we will be finished in and around half past four, but there is a great opportunity at the end for people to, to ask some, some questions and get some debate going, and today is all about that. Um, today is all about getting the opportunity to think, reflect, digest, and debate, and, and that's why we're here today again. And this is our second event, uh, and again, I'd like to thank uh, Suzanne, John Wells, and all the team for, for, for uh, giving us the venue here and the opportunity to host this masterclass. Um, nursing and midwifery in Ireland has a bit of a crisis on its hands. Some of you probably have figured that out. It's not salary cuts, and it's not the short staffing. It's not the health services continuous efficiency drive, and it's not the slashing of services. It's not the patient on trolleys, and it's not the cost deterrence of accessing emergency and primary care services, which I'm sure if you, you, you understand are free to medical card holders but 70 euro, 70 euro, or 100 euro to everyone else, regardless of their ability to pay, your vulnerability or your need. It's not the reducing skill mix, it's not the ma mass exodus of graduates and students, both from nursing and other allied healthcare professionals who are going to Europe and America and further afield in, in, in search of employment. It's not the increasing registration fee of which we've all, we're, we're all angst about and we've all been uh, um, uh, publicizing our discontent with. It's not the reducing interest in expanding our roles. Uh, the numbers who have expanded our roles in this country are still very reduced. The numbers of advanced nurse practitioners in this, in this, in this country is, 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 are, are tiny compared to other jurisdictions. And it's not necessarily the uh, number of nurse prescribers, who again is very, very, uh, who again it's very, very disappointing in this country to have such a monumental uh, piece of legislation to allow nurses to expand their role. No, it's not those. I could actually keep going with the list and fill my opening address with ten minutes of the things that uh, annoy us all and are to the to the forefront of of, of our thoughts and our conversations and in many, many coffee rooms and in many discussions around the country. It's none of these things. The crisis that nursing the midwifery has in Ireland at this current time is that we've fallen from grace in the minds of both the public and the media in terms of compassion, empathy and caring. It has been a slow and steady decline in the media and the public. But it has now become increasingly common for both the public and the media to bash nurses and nursing. Now everybody has a story about how they or a close family member were mistreated, forgotten, harmed, ignored or let down by a nurse. We see documentaries on TV in residential homes and IDE settings exposing abuse, and we hear all of the st stories all of the time about cruelty. It's very easy for us nurses to use all the things and all these, all, all, all these other very important contextual issues. It's very easy for us to use these as excuses for compassion, empathy, and caring shortfalls. But it is not, and never will it be good enough for the profession to have excuses. We owe it to all nurses and midwives who have gone before us and who will come after us, never to use excuses. We owe it to the public who once expected it, and somewhere in their hearts still do, 
and we owe it to our own families, our loved ones and friends, who will inevitably become a consumer of care provision and encounter a nurse at some day in their lives. The public and the media, I do admit, have a rosy and romantic view of, nurse, of what nursing used to be like. And some of this is fueled, as you know, by the popular TV programmes, The Midwife, say, set in the 60s in London, and the Royal set in uh, northeast of England, uh, or uh, northwest of England, uh, also in the 60s. But in my experience, nursing in Midwifery has always attracted and retained some of the most unlikely individuals you would ever expect to enter a caring profession. This might be a bit of a shock to some of you for me to say this, but this is my experience. We've all encountered vindictive, disturbingly uncaring and unsympathetic nursing colleagues during our careers. If we are honest, we have all most probably experienced or at least observed bullying to some degree within the profession. Why then are we surprised when all of the above are experienced by patients and families who are cared for by these nurses? I trained in the late 80s in East London and I worked on the old Nightingale style wards in Plasto Hospital right in the east end of, of London. There were no dementia units there, there was no assessment units, there was no in early intervention or respite care units. An elderly person was either long stay or rehab and they were in either one or the other. I distinctly remember that those wards were a mishmash of all sorts of patients in all sorts of situations. Dementing elderly patients were mixed with dying patients and middle-aged, frustrated head injury patients who had no other healthcare facilities uh, or nowhere where else to go. Um, I specifically remember the night duties, the noise, the constant needs of those patients on those wards, the wandering patients, those elderly women who were crying up and upset, the constant chanting of a few, the incontinence and repeated bed making of many. And I explicitly remember one or two nurses who were far from patient and kind at 4 a.m. in the morning changing draw sheets for the umpteen time. I, unfortunately for them, was a thorn in their side because as a student nurse, I was constantly buzzed on coffee and Diet Coke. I would sit talking to those patients for, for, for hours in the, in the small hours of the morning, especially those who couldn't sleep. And I would check and ask to change my patients every one to two hours. Those nurses would huff and puff and be very silent with me when helping me turn, change and wash my patients in the middle of the night. On many occasions, they were rough, they were unkind, and they were robotic. When I was on early shifts, I knew if these nurses were on the previous night shift, and I knew this because I could tell by the state of the patients. I could tell how unkempt they were. I could tell that their sheets were unchanged, and the whole tardiness of the ward, I could tell that. I got on with it, and I also got over it. I even got a little desensitized by it. I never openly asked my colleagues or fellow students if they had similar experiences. We didn't have reflective time for those, use, for those of you who have reflective time on your undergraduate program, and we certainly didn't have reflective diaries. We did, however, have a hospital social club underneath the hospital where it was 80 pence a pint. And uh, it never took me long with 80 pence a pint uh, to get over it and on with it. Um, but one thing I never did was accept it. Uh, and uh, it was something that uh, my, my, my grandmother had instilled in me in relation to what you permit, you promote. And I think that's something I'd like you to take with you today. If you permit something to happen or take place, well then you're actually promoting it within the profession. My coping mechanism at this time was that I accepted that we all had similar stories to tell. And sure, sometimes I was only there for six or eight weeks. I didn't have to object, but I didn't have to uh, permit myself to be involved in it. Roll on 25 years and I often wonder if some of you people here, the young students and graduate nurses today, ever experienced what I did in the late 80s. Uh, but when I read the Lee's Cross nursing home scandal, the Francis report on Mid-Staffordshire and the growing list of very working, worrying HICWA reports on their website, I reckon that not too much in fact has changed except a pint is now four euro eighty of course and not 80 pence as I can, I can tell. The most inspiring thing I did in the last eight to 10 years was visit Salford Royal Infirmary in May earlier this year. I put this paragraph in because it was abysmal up until then. I'm starting to go very, get very depressing and I was starting to depress myself. 
but I attended um, a European quality improvement research event and part of this included a visit to a number of world-class quality improvement showcase example sites and I was lucky enough to be chosen to go to Ro Salford Royal Infirmary um, and that was my allocated site and I attended this visit with John Overvit. And for those of you who don't know John Overvit, just t scribble his name down and Google him when you finish uh, today because he's the most prolific, well-respected researcher in terms of quality and improvement. Um, and I was lucky enough that we shared a cab on the way to Salford Royal Infirmary, so I was in my element. During the car journey, I told John Overvit about the 14 reasons why I was excited about going to Salford Royal Infirmary. It was the 8.7 reduction in risk-adjusted weekend mortality that they had uh, uh, achieved the previous year. So they had reduced the deaths in that hospital over the weekend by 8.7%. Over 420 days without an MRSA bloodstream infection in that hospital in two th between 2013 and 2015. 62% reduction in Clostridium difficile infections. Over 365 days without a grade three or grade four pressure, uh, sore pressure ulcer. Over 50% of the wards had achieved 12 months without any pressure ulcer at all of any grade. 96% of patients had VTE risk assessment completed. 38% had reduced the readmission rate for elective knee and elective hip surgery. 24% in patients were having accurate lists of medications in their emergency admission units. And over a year without a serious incident in theatres within the division of surgery. Over one year without a serious incident. Over a year, or sorry, they maintained 95%, which is almost 100%, in those of you who are doing statistics, uh, 0.5, as you know, is for a p-value is acceptable. 95% uh, compliance with evidence-based surgical site infection bundle, 95% compliance with Salford Royal Dementia and Delirium Care Bundle, and 97.3 of Salford Royal patients receive harm-free care. 90% of Salford Royal patients rate their care on the NHS websites as being excellent or very good. And it won the best trust nationally in the NHS staff survey in 2013, where it's not mandatory for staff to fill out questionnaires in relation to whether they're happy to work for somewhere or not. In the cab, John shrugged his shoulders and smirked. On arrival in Salford, we were whisked off to listen to the corporate speak about how wonderful Salford was and how they had moved from bottom ranked NHS trust to the top three ranked NHS trust in seven years. And I observed John quiz the DONs, their deputies, and the QI manager, the quality improvement manager, and the data manager. He wrote furious notes and he shook his head from time to time. At coffee time, he whispered to me that what we had heard from the management team in Royal Salford was pure horseshit. Quality and improvement on an unbelievable scale and pace, he muttered. Corporate fa a, a, a corporate facade and data massaging, he whispered to me as we were ushered into smaller groups so that we could visit the ward. What we then observed, though, was both exciting and inspirational. All of the wards we visited openly displayed their ward data with hundreds of days of infection-free, error-free, and falls-free data. Patient bays were never, ever left unattended, ever. Each bay had 10 by 8 photographs of the staff who were on duty that day. There was no Dynamaps and no oral thermometers in this hospital. Nurses held patient hands, took their pulse, and did their observations by the bedside and spoke to their patients. They were unable to sit at the bedside because they were in the, in the bay with the patients. On one medical ward, we noticed that the falls display registered only 22 days since a fall. John Overvid asked about this performance met metric and why it was lower than all the other wards we had visited. The ward sister became visibly upset at being asked about this, and she explained that they had held a hospital record of 398 days without a fall until one afternoon a patient fell. And the nurse who was on duty was completely devastated that this had happened on her shift. And she explained that, in fact, the whole team were affected by this. Now, can I ask anybody in the room here, or any nurse who's here, have they ever worked on a hospital or a ward where there are practically zero falls, harms, or mishaps? Have they? where ward teams are wholly devastated 
when there's a fall or when they fall below standard or have a near miss incident or cause harm. I can't. On the journey home, John said to me that Salford Royal Infirmary was the most impressive healthcare facility he had in recent years. I asked him about the horseshit comment on the way to visit the wards, and he said to me, it wasn't because of all the impressive improvement metrics that were being chanted to us before our visit. It was because they collectively cared. They openly showed interest, empathy, energy, vigor, and dedication to their patients and their visitors. He said they didn't measure compassion. They didn't have to. The reason I've told you about my visit to Salford Royal Infirmary is because I believe that we, the nurses in this country, the nurses in this region, in fact, the nurses in this room, we can do things differently. We can choose to be a Salford Royal Infirmary and take absolute pride in the work that we do. We should be noticeably embarrassed, upset and annoyed when we don't meet the expected professional standards. We should be. We can choose to begin a journey of improvement, not only in the services we provide, but in the, but in the professional culture in which we operate and practice. The vast majority of nurses I know want to do their very best. They want to be compassionate, attentive and kind. The only thing from preventing us going on this journey of professional culture improvement is actually ourselves. It's a personal thing. It's not an organizational thing at all. Offering all of the half-baked excuses for below par performance in the areas of compassion, empathy, patience and kindness is in my mind no longer professionally acceptable. We should acknowledge compassion fatigue and strive to understand it and its antithesis too. We should, however, accept it as a, we should, however, never accept it as a reason for below par nurse patient interaction or poor standards of care. Measuring compassion fatigue has gained a lot of interest in the nursing and healthcare literature recently. And I was just talking to Fiona about this outside. Um, when you're trying to do a literature review and somebody, somebody's publishing every week in this area, it's very difficult to get a grasp and a hold of the, of the literature in relation to compassion. I personally believe that our efforts should be channeled into measuring the complete opposite of compassion fatigue. And I'm afraid it's a psychology thing with me. If you ask an, unfriend, an unwell friend or colleague how sick they are, they will tell you. If you ask them how well they are, you will most probably get a more upbeat picture. And therefore, I believe we should use the same positive psychology lens for measuring compassion and humanity. Let's stop asking how fatigued we are when it comes to compassion and humanity. Let's start asking and measuring what we did each day, each shift, each nursing intervention and each patient interaction to make it different in our patient's eyes. We all think we're caring, compassionate, patient and kind until we are put to the test. The intoxicated, non-English speaking Eastern European attending the department, the acutely unwell or dying traveler and their extended family needs, used incontinent, wandering elderly patient on night duty. Today's masterclass is an opportunity for us to stop, to reflect, and to take stock of ourselves. Remind us that we actually want to be, or we have previously aspired to be. The nurse or midwife we want our families and our loved ones to encounter in their time of need. I very much welcome Sarah and Hillary's presentations, their thoughts and their perspectives on compassion, self-care, spirituality, and connection. I want to thank Mary Prendergast from St. Patrick's in Cashel for bringing Professor Kagan and Hillary to the southeast and affording us the opportunity to listen, reflect and discuss a very and most pertinent professional topic. I want to extend thanks to Professor John Wells, Dr. Suzanne Deniff and the team here in WIT for hosting and streaming the, this afternoon's event and I very much look forward to sitting and listening with you and I'm very happy to try and facilitate future type events like this of a similar nature or associated professional topic of interest. I've probably gone over my 10 minutes, but what the hell. Thank you very much. Mark, I want to say a very big thank you to you. It was an extremely thought-provoking speech, and I'm sure that Sarah and Hilary will likewise raise such thoughts with us that we will bring with us back out to practice. So as chair this afternoon, it just gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, and that is Dr. Hilary Dunn. 
and Hilary is the Managing Trustee of the Irish Society for Quality and Safety in Healthcare. And she joined that organisation in 2004 and she was promoted to Chief Executive in 2007. She has a PhD from the University of Reading, an MBA from UCD, an MBA from DCU and a HDIP from RCSI, so extremely well and very rounded education there. She has continuously worked to promote quality and safety in healthcare. And her research portfolio includes the largest survey of patients in acute general hospitals in Ireland. She has also ascertained the views of those patients in health services. She's ascertained the views of patients who have worked who are 10 day centres. And just there recently, she's been involved in the National Qualitative Research Project that investigated responses to NIMBYs, the Nursing and Midwifery Board of Ireland's new proposed Code of Conduct and Ethics for Nurses and Midwives. And she's a passionate advocate for bridging the gap between service providers and patients. And she sought to educate and empower patients and healthcare providers to support and to promote patient feedback and we're delighted to have Hilary here today speaking to us. So you'll have to bear with me while I try and work out uh, my attempt at a Prezi presentation. something new. I like to push myself every now and again. So hopefully this will work. It's okay. And uh, like Mark, I suppose I kind of sat down um, over the last couple of months I've been thinking about different things. So um, I'm going to read part of what I've written and most of what I've written really, I suppose. And it's really, I'm into stories. You know, I like patient stories, I want to hear the patient story, and so when I write now, or when I present now, I tend to talk about the story. So, um, I suppose really when Mary Prendergast first asked me to come here today, um, she, you know, I immediately agreed to do that, and she said to me, send me on your title. Um, and I joked last night that there's Mary's, there, there's free will, and then there's Mary's will. And if you're not fast enough with Mary, Mary sends you a title. And that's the reason I got this lovely title, which when I read it out to my friends and family, they laughed. But it was my father who went into a state of hysterics laughing that really shook me. And I thought, God, I don't know what I'm going to talk about now because he's really questioning me. Um, but myself and my dad are very alike. You know, we deal in facts and we're not very tactile. And we have a real desire to question all things before we make up our mind. My mother is actually the complete opposite, and it is no surprise to me, therefore, that the pictures you see here are St. Francis of Sisi, on which, whose feast day I was born, and she called me Francis. And her friend was a priest by the name of Father Hilary, and she called me Hilary Francis. Um, and she was very happy with that, and she was religious, and I'm going to dispel the spirituality and religious piece here and say that I'm not at all religious. Uh, births, deaths, and marriages, that's about as much as I do. I pray my own way, um, and I revolted against the, the climate of going to Mass every Sunday, which was practically bet into us as children. But it really wasn't until I got depression and some very other chronic conditions that I really started to think about things differently to explore aspects of life and illness. Lately, I've started to think about life and death and the components that affect us in life when you are ill. And what can be done by both patients and caregivers who enter into rewarding relationships. So as I talk here today, you may feel it's all very disconnected. It probably is. But I stand here today not with any answers, but with lots of questions and topics I'd like you to think about. And these are simply my thoughts on what it's like to have a chronic illness and what I think about compassion in healthcare. So I'd like to start with the word pity. I mentioned this to my mother on the way down here and she said to me, please don't talk about pity. Nobody likes to talk about that word. It's a little bit of a taboo word. But I happened to be reading Atul Gawande's book, Being Mortal. I don't like his other books. I have to be honest, 
checklist manifesto. I, I, I revolt against that. But I decided to, I'd wanted to see what he had to say about being mortal. And in it he quotes, apart from Tolstoy's The Death of Ivanovich, and he says of him when he was dying, no one pitied him as he wished to be pitied. At certain moments after prolonged suffering, he wished most of all, though he would have been ashamed to confess it, for someone to pity him as a sick child is pitied. He longed to be petted and comforted. He knew he was an important functionary. They had a beard turning gray, and that therefore what he longed for was impossible, but he still longed for it. As someone with a chronic illness, I never thought about the word pity. It wasn't something that meant anything to me. When I read this, though, I clearly understood it, because recently, an off-the-cuff remark by a friend during a chronic bout of arthritis had upset me. I was in chronic pain and felt severely the weight of depression on my shoulders. And she said to me, stop trying to make us feel sorry for you. Her words stung me and stunned me. For years I had listened to her, her doubts, her concerns, her stories about her life. I'd always been a shoulder to cry on for her and someone who made her laugh when things weren't going great. So you can imagine that it struck me to my core and I started to analyse the situation. Was I moaning? Was I whinging? Maybe I was, complaining too much. But then I realised I was just looking for some kindness some compassion during what was a difficult time for me. I realized I was not looking for pity, but compassion, and I started to think about why we can show compassion in some situations and why not in others. You see, if there's a cure, it gives some level of hope. And you can be com compassionate because there's an end. With a chronic illness, it becomes more difficult because this is something that is going to be ongoing, and to be compassionate in this situation requires commitment. <coughs> it is a requirement for commitment that many find difficult to provide in long-term situations. Now, if you take that premise, you can apply it to a myriad of situations. In GP care, it's interesting to note that some illnesses instill a greater level of compassion. In a lot of cases, these are acute or sudden terminal illnesses, but again, you may well find that there's a pack, pattern of a lack of compassion in chronic med, mental health or elderly care. The phrase, the worried well, springs to mind. I never heard this until a couple of years ago when I presented to a group of GPs. And it shocked me that they referred to patients as the worried well. That group who are continuously in the surgery with health issues that are not perceived as important by the GP. I started to watch out for this lack of compassion and kindness or indifference while engaging in my own health care and that of my family and friends. I started to think and consider how it was demonstrated or not during health care episodes. Now, it would appear that traditionally, the ideal of combining clinical competence with compassion has been a central feature of the practice of medicine throughout history. Who knew? Because there are so many instances where compassion is not evident. In this blog, a medical student captures some of the key points that clinicians encounter. Dear Mrs. B, we didn't know each other very well. You might recognize my face from rounds. I was the girl in the corner holding your numbers, looking at the ground or out the window. I occasionally asked you how you were, and you always told me the same thing, pain, so much pain. And I didn't know what to do. I wanted to hold your hand, but my head always made excuses. I had to continue on the round. I had to be professional. I had to maintain my distance. But I always thought about you through the day. I thought about how I wanted to sit by your bed and hear your stories, capture your last days on earth, capture the rich life I'm sure you've lived. She goes on and she talks a bit more, but she finishes with this. 
And you may never know this, but you made a difference to me. When I see another patient approaching their final moments, I will stop and talk. I'll ask them how they are, if there's anything they need, about their life, their children, their loved ones. I promise that I won't just be a doctor. I'll be someone who makes them feel valued. I'll make them feel that their last moments are being remembered. She finishes with, I'm sorry I didn't do that for you. For me, this blog demonstrates that we all make mistakes. That like all of us, clinicians are not always right. That there is learning required and that improvements can happen and changes can make a difference. This letter made me think of another encounter that happened to my family. My father has Crohn's disease and COPD and he was in the emergency department of a hospital and he was really sick. His breathing was very difficult and he was extremely dehydrated. We were waiting for the doctor and I was looking through his chart because I'm very nosy. I'm also bossy. And I noticed on the front of his chart, DNR written in red pen, do not resuscitate. I immediately felt a sense of panic. As his main support in hospital, I could not believe he had agreed to not be resuscitated. And I questioned him very angrily about it. He looked at me with an amazed face as if I had gone mad. He told me that under all circumstances he wanted to be resuscitated. He has an amazing ability to fight back to, his, back to beat his illness. We call him Lazarus. When we asked about it later, we were told that it was common. The norm even. No one knew who had written it. No signature. No agreement. Just a decision made in isolation by some unknown person. The reason I tell you this story is that decisions like this, for me, show a real lack of compassion. That failure to discuss this decision with the patient and the family is a failure to recognize the individual. It ignores the right of the patient to have their needs and their wishes taken into account. This is in stark contrast to the story in the UK recently, which you can see in this beautiful picture, of Sheila Marsh, who had a great fondness for almonds that had two horses. And her dying wish was that she could say goodbye to her horse. And in the hospital she was in, the hospital worked with her daughter, and they brought the hospital in so that her mother could say goodbye. She died hours later after this emotional reunion. Her daughter said she took so much comfort out of it and it was a beautiful moment. The main point for me about this is that we need to have conversations and we need to have conversations about the difficult things in life. They're hard, but we need to have them. Then this will lead me now on to purpose as clinicians and patients. As patients, we expect a lot from our clinicians. But I confess, I have thought lately about the nightmare patient. And I'm one. And I know I am. I'm okay with that. I want my doctors and nurses at their best when I am at my worst. I demand their knowledge, their compassion, their empathy, their understanding. I want this equally balanced, discursive relationship. But what do I give in return? I pay my money for my visits to my GPs or to consultants or to the hospital. And I expect them to be right. After all, they're clinicians. They're earning a decent salary. And I expect them to know, to fix, 
to mend, but what do I give you in return for your advice and your kindness? I've thought so much about this lately. I couldn't help wondering why people decide to become clinicians. Is it for the money, for the prestige, because it's a family business, or because they feel that they can really make a difference, because they feel they have a purpose? I thought about all the clinicians I've known over the years, personally, through work, from all lives, walks of life, rich, poor, family business, first-timers, egotistical, honest, change makers, followers. It's funny, but as a researcher by trade, I started to look at the various people I know, and I analyzed them. However, during this process, I had to look at the type of patient that I, my family, and friends were. At the end of the day, I truly believe in equal partnerships between patients and clinicians, but I questioned again what I, as a patient, brought to the table. This is the question I have struggled with for so long. After all, was I, the, I was there reluctantly after all. I didn't ask to be sick, or did I? This tr question kept troubling me because maybe I did. Maybe I didn't do the right things when I should have. Maybe I wasn't kind enough to myself when I should have been. And maybe I didn't take action soon enough. Maybe I failed to take care of myself. So I guess the conclusion from this that I came to is that pa as patients, we need to try to make help ourselves within this equal partnership. We need to take some responsibility. But equally, clinicians need to think and see that they are only part of the relationship. And they need to think about their purpose as a clinician and what they will bring to the table. Now this leads me to another point. I should say, this is the slide, Prezi, should have come up. It's a quote about killing myself slowly. But I'll come back to it. But actually, I'll go back there. So, guilt. I know I feel guilty. I feel guilty all the time. I feel guilty that I'm allowing my illness to take over my life. Guilty I'm not a good mother. Guilty that I failed as a wife. Guilty I don't do more for my parents. But most of all, I feel guilty for not being a better me. A kinder, more tolerant, understanding me. And I feel this every day. I constantly contemplate that I let this illness take over that I didn't fight it enough, that it won and I lost. Every day a part of me thinks about that. And on the bad days, this quote sums it up for me. There is no difference to what I do every day to those who commit suicide. I just chose the slower road. I think it's a really powerful quote about looking after our, ourselves as people. In contrast, on the good days, I try to convince myself that a house is a home, that I didn't lose but chose, that I chose to accept to do the best within the resources I have. Guilt is a theme that is discussed by patients within their closed groups. It's not a topic that is discussed by clinicians with their patients. The result can often be a patient in conflict with themselves, and this conflict can spill over and make them a difficult patient. Difficult patients offer clinicians an opportunity to increase the compassion they show. This will prevent clinicians feeling guilty 
and very much in the way the previous blog outlined. You don't want to bring that guilt with you. After all, who wants a life filled with regret? My final point is about kindness. Now I have spoken about guilt, but recently I went to see a consultant and during the course of the consultation he asked me about my depression. He wanted to know why I was refusing to take medication for my depression. And to be honest, I expected him to disagree with my logic. So I was really surprised by his response. I explained to him that as a mother of three living in constant pain, it often meant I had to ask my children not to sit on me, hug, and to give me space. Very hard. But I did explain to him that I needed to live my life and feed the highs and lows, because that's what life is, highs and lows, and balancing those out. And I didn't want to live my life as a lackluster on a level playing field, because that's not me. And I questioned how I could be a real mother if I did that. And he waited till I finished, and he said to me, are you kind to yourself? Just be kind to yourself. And for me, I just felt it was one of the most compassionate encounters I've ever experienced. He listened, he heard, he understood, and he treated. He was aware of his purpose. And through this, his compassion shone through. I'd like to reiterate what I said at the beginning, that I have no solutions. I have no solutions about spirituality or compassion. And these are just points and topics and questions that I've asked myself, and maybe you will find time to ask yourselves these. So I have four more slides. I always like a take-home message, you know? I always feel it's good. If you have tuned out early, you can take home the message. It's always good. So as a patient, I would say to you, Sorry, as a person, I would say to you, be kind. And this is for all of us, clinicians or pa pa patients alike. Be kind to yourself. Stay true to who you are. Love yourself so that others can love you. On the inside of my wedding band, my husband has written, love you and me. We argued venomously about it, I tell you, when he proposed to me and gave me that ring. I said to him, I want to be loved for me. And he said, no, I can't love you more than I love myself. And he said, when you understand that, he said, you'll have found out what I mean. And my third point is live your life the best you're, you can, given the resources that you have. Have no regrets. As a patient, I say, help yourself so that others can help you. Understand the humanity of doctors and clinicians, value their knowledge, their learning, their experience, but know that they can make mistakes. Show compassion, but stay strong. Garner your inner strength. And to caregivers, I say, understand, listen, hear, discuss, know, and empathize. Know and understand your purpose and what you bring to the table. And care, just care, give a damn. See the person, not the illness, and know that someday it may be you. So, as all things that are fated, um, lots of people sent me lots of bits for this presentation, it was wonderful. But the last piece that I give you is, um, I'm on a network for people with chronic pain, and somebody just happened to send this one to me, and I just thought I couldn't have said it better. It's from the Golden Girls, and I just feel I'm not going to sum do a summation. This old. is my summation. I'm sorry, I really don't remember. Maybe you're getting old. <laughs> That's a little joke. Well, I tell you, Dr. Budd, I really am sick. I have chronic fatigue syndrome. That is a real illness. You can check with the Center for Disease Control. Oh, well, I'm sorry about that. Well, I'm glad. 
At least I know I have something. I'm sure. Well, nice seeing you. Not so fast. <laughs> there are some things I have to say. There are a lot of things that I have to say. Words can't express what I have to say. What I went through, what you put me through. I can't do this in a restaurant. Good. But I will. <laughs> Lewis, who is this person? Look, miss, sit. I sat for you long enough. <laughs> Dr. Bud, I came to you sick, sick and scared, and you dismissed me. You didn't have the answer, and instead of saying, I'm sorry, I don't know what's wrong with you, you made me feel crazy, like, like I had made it all up. You dismissed me. You made me feel like a, a child, a, a fool, a neurotic who was wasting your precious time. Is that, is that your caring profession? Is that healing? No one deserves that kind of treatment, Dr. Bud. No one. I suspect had I been a man, I might have been taken a little bit more seriously and not told to go to a hairdresser. Look, I am not going to sit here anymore. Shut up, Lois. <laughs> I don't know where you doctors lose your humanity, but you lose it. You know, if all of you at the beginning of your careers could get very sick and very scared for a while, you'd probably learn more from that than anything else. You'd better start listening to your patients. They need to be heard. They need caring. They need compassion. They need attending to. You know, someday, Dr. Bud, you're going to be on the other side of the table. And as angry as I am, and as angry as I always will be, I still wish you a better doctor than you were to me. I think I speak for all of us to say how much we really appreciate your honesty and your frankness and that we've all heard you, we've all listened, and I hope we can bring it out with us. Now, so I'd like to introduce the next speaker. Uh, Professor Sarah Kagan comes to us a little bit further than Hillary does. Sarah comes to us from the University of Pennsylvania, and we're very honored to have her over with us in Ireland. Sarah is the Lucy Walker Honorary Term Professor of Gerontological Nursing at the University of Pennsylvania. And in addition to that, she holds many other roles. She is a geriatric clinical nurse specialist in the Living Well program in the University Hospital of Pennsylvania. She is adjunct professor in the American University of Armenia. She's visiting professor at the Oxford Brookes University Faculty of Life and Health Sciences of the UK. She's honorary professor in the Department of Community Medicine in the University of Hong Kong. She has numerous qualifications and including in her qualifications, she has an honorary doctorate of science from Oxford Brookes. She has maintained her clinical focus. She runs two clinically based undergraduate international exchange programs in nursing. She has a practice in geriatric oncology. I don't know where, she obviously lives in a different time frame from us because she can fit all of that into 24 hours a day. And we are very honoured to have Sarah here speaking to us today. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, and okay, I promise you that Mark and Hillary and I did not did not talk about our presentations at all. And I want you to think, by the end of my time with you, I want you to think, why am I telling you that? Why is it that it's important for you to know we didn't talk? I will say I'm thrilled to be back here as I'm uh, switching out of Prezi because I'm not cool enough to do Prezi. Um, I had to stick with PowerPoint. Um, and here's my PowerPoint, um, but as you can see, Hillary and I have something in common. I think we both love beauty and we both love expression. And this is my second time back in Waterford. I'm quite excited, second trip to Ireland. I love coming back. And I love the fact that I have such treasured colleagues 
Suzanne, Hillary, and Mark are people I've now known for a year, and I'm privileged to call them friend as well as colleague. And I want you to contemplate the idea that if you can surround yourselves with like-minded individuals, even if you're separated by thousands of kilometers, you can accomplish a great deal. It is about finding and embracing in each other what it is that we're here to do. And how many of you are pre-registration students? Just give me a sense. Any pre-registration students? Yay, fabulous. Good career choice. Aging world, you will never run out of things to which you can contribute. And the rest of you, postgraduate? How many are postgraduate? OK. Uh, teachers? OK. Um, clinicians? For not in school? OK. All right. Um, who are the rest of you? Did I miss anyone? OK, you all fit into that group. So I'm going to try to synthesize things. I didn't know that, as we say in America, I'd be batting cleanup. But I'm batting cleanup. By the way, I don't really understand baseball, but I am American. And I did learn a, a hurling phrase, pulling a blinder. So I'm going to try to pull a blinder for you. Because I bring you greetings from Philadelphia with the message that we're all in this together. We could choose a far easier path in life than nursing. We're in it for a reason, and we've got to be true to ourselves. If you chose it, then live it and honor it. Um, I always remind people that I work at the University of Pennsylvania, and if you know a little bit of American history, you know that this guy here, Benjamin Franklin, founded our university, founded the hospital, Pennsylvania Hospital, um, which is the first hospital in the colonies, and was a very famous fan of nursing. If it were not for nursing, I'm paraphrasing, I can't remember the direct quote. I always remind people that Franklin said, if it were not for nursing, citizens would not be returned to the full duties of their citizenship. And I think that being a nurse is about citizenship. Holding the trust is about citizenship. Why are we doing this? Well, first I will say I'm doing this because I know Mary Prendergast and all of the people to whom she's connected me. So I'm incredibly grateful to Professor Wells for having me back to WIT, um, to Mark um, for facilitating this with Suzanne, um, to Hillary for everything, including getting me here well ahead of time, I might add and Mary and Bridget who bring me to Ireland and for that I am eternally grateful. I'm grateful in the same way that I am grateful to the patients for whom I provided care over 29 years. They have taught me pretty much everything I know and I'm truly about passing on what I know and I tell my patients what you teach me I will take to others and use it to help them in the same way you and I have helped each other. Nursing is a bilateral, reciprocal relationship. And I've learned that from my research participants as well as treasured colleagues like those here. I do disclose to you that I have no competing or conflicting interests. We're required in America to say that, save one. So it's not financial. It has no real value except to me, and I hope I will share that value with you. I am very passionate. And usually people will say, oh my, you're very passionate. I think after following Mark's passion and Hillary's passion, you're going to kind of think, ooh, quiet American. Maybe that's because I saw John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara in The Quiet Man on television the other night. But in any event, I want you, I hope, to walk away feeling your passion. I hope you've listened to Mark's passion in exposing the crisis in care that I think we all feel. I don't think Ireland is alone in this. I want you to feel Hillary's passion in representing what we should all understand. And now I'm going to ask you a critical question in disclosing my passion. How many of you here are patients? How many of you here are patients? Clients, patients? OK, a few of you. Yeah, so some of you know I ask this question for a real purpose, in part because I've had my own painful journey in understanding that part of the reason I do what I do is because, first, we're all patients. We're all clients. We all need health care. 
We all need social care. No matter how invincible we think we are, we all need it. We must acknowledge that. To assume the socially ascribed mantle of patient in most societies is to lose power. To assume the socially ascribed mantle of clinician is to gain power in most societies. But unfortunately, that commonly results in not being heard, in misunderstanding, and in mistrust and pain. I've had that experience as a patient, and that's made me ever more dedicated to talking to colleagues like you to say, wait, wait a minute. We didn't become nurses to exert power unless we acknowledge that power for good only comes through reciprocal relationships. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today. I do want to um, say to you that uh, most of what I've provided you visually has seemingly nothing to do with healthcare, nothing to do with human beings, except that it's work produced by an incredible artist, Joyce Tennyson, who's given me permission to use her images for teaching purposes um, when I need to, and I really felt I needed to. So all of these images are hers, um, with the exception of those of Penn, uh, which were done by a former exchange student, Charlotte Glasspool. And I do encourage you to take a look at Joyce Tennyson's work, because she also takes pictures of people that are just incredible. Um, as we go on, uh, you'll probably see that I am always the teacher, and aren't nurses always teachers? But in teaching, we have to then recognize that we also learn. We are only as good at teaching as what we're learning from others, and often those we are teaching can teach us the most about what we need to learn. So I do have objectives for you, but I hope, you're, I hope you came with objectives, and if you didn't come with objectives, I, I count on the idea that you're getting some now, having heard what Mark and Hillary have to say. So I'm just going to talk about some big ideas and share with you the musings that I've come to by thinking about how much the personal and the professional must intersect if we are going to care for other people. So this has been a long process for me. I've been a nurse for 29 years, and I think that I, I really started out believing that everyone could invest in compassion and empathy as the foundation for their care, and I foolishly took it for granted. Um, more recently, in the past decade or so of my life, I've recognized that, for example, in America, we can't even talk about compassion directly. The most we can do, the best we can do right now is talk about compassion fatigue. That's a sad extension of a pervasive biomedical model. Current interpretations of allopathic biomedicine say, see the problem first. There's a reason that Mark had to give you the analysis that he did at the beginning. Because we're so immersed in the biomedical paradigm that says look for the disease or the injury and cut it out or medicate it out of existence that we can't see what's right in front of us. So people like Mary and Hillary and Deborah Siegel at home, along with my dear friends Angela and Alicia, with whom I speak pretty much every day, we've all been engaged in a conversation, whether electronically or in real face-to-face -face experiences. We've been trying to think about, what is this all about? And here's what I'd say. The first is, I'm not really going to talk about spirituality directly, but by implication, and by implication, I then am pointing to a fundamental assumption. The fundamental assumption is that if you're a human being, you have a spirit. So we need to stop thinking about spirit as something we add on or refer to the pastoral care people or only understand when people are overtly religious. Everyone has spirit. Atheist, agnostic, or the most devoted religious person, we are all spirits and spiritual. And 
that's a place from which I'd like you to consider the idea that compassion is and must be about understanding ourselves as human beings first and foremost before we can consider our relationship with others. Our relationship with others is really an extension of ourselves and I love the fact that Hillary's husband made that point in proposing to her. If we cannot care for and love ourselves, how are we to even understand care for or love for another? Empathy is how we direct that care and love toward others. The essence of empathy, sorry, I get a little rot about this, is the capacity to sense another's plight. But if we don't know our own plight, how is it that we will even begin to grasp another's? In order to feel that empathy, then, we need to recognize and understand our own humanity. Our humanity of frailty, vulnerability, ability, and capacity. Without the self-knowledge, I would put to you that we really have no frame with which to empathize with others and to feel the sort of compassion that we need to for them because if we don't do it for ourselves, then we have no real frame of reference. We compare as a way of being human. In order to fully realize compassion and empathy in ourselves, we must identify the way in which we protect, defend, and sometimes even hide ourselves. And we need to understand that we're hiding from the pain of being human. There are many times when I'm caught, um, you know, Mark talked about cruelty. I'm caught by the thought of how can another human being do whatever it is I've just observed to another human being? But isn't the disconnection, the disengagement, and sometimes the overt cruelty, that which, which results in pain, really about defending ourselves? In fact, I think it is most of the time. We elevate ourselves. I believe the, uh, the uh, term that we gain from um, sort of uh, a, a school of European philosophy that's now become very popularized, so I won't go into the philosophy, is schadenfreude, the, the sort of joy in someone else's pain. We elevate ourselves with protection. Psychologists and psychiatrists, other mental health professionals would call it a defense mechanism. And the joke in America is denial. It's not just a river in Africa, if you understand American English inflections. But in joking about defense mechanisms, we are defending ourselves because there are many times in which what we experience in ourselves, our own vulnerabilities, our own frailties, particularly when we're in a caregiving situation, make us incredibly afraid. They make us hurt. They make us doubt. And in that moment of fear, we withdraw. The challenge we have as nurses is not to withdraw, but to reflect. To reflect in the moment, to reflect on the moment, and to find a way to deepen the understanding, to extend ourselves out of the fear and pain beyond the protection in order to protect others. In fact, I think, as I've mentioned, that power is really about socially ascribed roles and the differentials that so often occur. And of course, my frame of reference for that is the patient-clinician relationship in which title and knowledge often privileges one person over another who is disadvantaged by need. How sad that it is that way when, in fact, we are all needful at many different times in our lives, and we all crave the care and compassion that comes with the acknowledgement of that need. I really came to this point in a moment of clarity that's very close to my own area of scholarship by thinking about ageism. Because unlike racism and sexism, ageism will affect us all, or so in an odd way we hope. Let me explain that for a minute. Ageism is different from other forms of discrimination because it is about something we all hope to become, not about 
a perceived difference that we think makes us separate, but really doesn't. Ageism is a discrimination then against our future selves. It is a discrimination actively, so the expression of it is a discrimination against those who represent our future selves and what we simultaneously hope to become and fear being. And unfortunately, nurses very commonly have stilted or even slanted and skewed, dramatically skewed, skewed views of what it means to live a life of nine, 10, or even 11 decades. And because we are so deeply steeped in the biomedical paradigm of problem and solution, we see aging from a deficit perspective rather than a vantage point of strength and value. So we can often be sad to say, among the most positively intended ageist people I know, and we limit our compassion in that because we fail to confront what it is that is resulting in our undue exertion of negative power over the power for good that we hope to achieve. So I ask myself then, what can we learn spiritually from the realization that ageism is in fact fear springing from a future once hoped for and loathed? How can we rest with the idea of peace in understanding that the myth of independence, the myth that is the source of our power, that is, you're an adult, you're powerful, you've got knowledge, you've got education, you can exert it. Now, of course, that comes to the worst ends as we think about, you know, sort of the crushing um, issues of corporatization and finance and other things that we're surrounded with by in the news, but we also see it in healthcare. We see the power of being able to stride down the hallway and not have a damaged neurologic system or a malignancy or something as simple as, Hillary pointed out, arthritis, which affects millions of people worldwide and yet is almost entirely neglected because, hey, it's arthritis. But all of these conditions make people's lives different and they affect people of all abilities, all capacities, and all ages. And in fact, what they do is put us in a place of trying to deny that we are interdependent. None of us is fully or ever independent. We all live in the context of families, communities, friends, societies. We then rely on the idea that there are others who've got our backs others who will care for us in times of need. But what happens in healthcare institutions, in healthcare and social care settings, that we invest in a myth built on privileging certain capacities over others, physical strength over wisdom, for example. In discarding the myth of independence for the reality of evolving interdependence over our lifespans, I hope we may become more completely able to recognize and value our wholeness, strength and frailty, capacity and vulnerability, to achieve our dream of ever-expanding compassion. Because who wants to be in a profession where, hey, I'm competent, whatever? That becomes boring. And let me tell you, if you haven't tried it, I recommend not doing it because stagnation is a sure way to burn out faster than anything else. So the compassion grounded in the full span and arc of our lives, I think, generates empathy and the ability to care as long as we care for ourselves first. Care begins and ends, as both Mark and Hillary have said in different ways, with compassion and it's only that which emerges in recognition of our shared humanness. 
only in coming to terms with and understanding ourselves as equally and uniquely human with frailty, vulnerability, and the potential for pain and hurt at any given moment with even the slightest statement. I've had patients tell me, and last year Mary and I shared experiences about this in this very hall. I've had patients come back to me years later and say, you probably won't remember saying this, but I remember and it made a difference. I cringe at those people who haven't called me to say, I've forever lived with your words and they've hurt ever since. Because we all do make mistakes and we have to live with that and compensate for it. Because it's only then that we can discard the power that protects us so that we can achieve the power for good in order to attain compassion, empathy, and true capacity to comfort and heal. Last year, I took away with me from this very visit. I was here a year ago for this week last year. Um, sorry, a little redundant there. And Hillary taught me about the cup of tea. Um, she taught us all, I think, about compassion, concern, empathy, and care as she illustrated how knowing the way someone takes his or her cup of tea is the pure expression of healing energy. And I've remembered that ever since, probably because I got it. I'm only a tea drinker. I go around the world looking for a decent cup of tea, and I'm thrilled when it's a great cup of tea. It comforts me the way nothing else can. But I also realized in Hillary's beautiful mental metaphor the fundamental notion that we can understand the cup of tea, whether it's tea, coffee, or something else, that can be illustrated in cultures and communities around the globe. If we could only get that as we traveled around the globe. And so I am then compelled to talk with you and to know myself at a very essential level that knowing, knowing the person truly and healing ourselves, knowing us first as people and knowing then others is requisite. You can't be a nurse and not take care of yourself. So anybody who's saying, yeah, self-care, fluffy stuff, whatever, is wrong. You will pay the price. I neglected my self-care for some time trying to keep up, and I paid the price. I'm trying to tell you this not because it's a fancy lecture, but because I really think it will make a difference in your life. And if I can make a difference in your life and your life and your life, then I can probably make a difference in hundreds of lives. Because I'll share with you, as I have been, the sometimes pain-filled career of 29 years that I've had. But with those 29 years where I've always been proud, incredibly proud to say I am a nurse. Not I'm a clinical nurse specialist, not I'm an advanced practice nurse or a nurse teacher. I'm fundamentally and essentially a nurse. I'm a nurse because I've gained a string of pearls of wisdom that other people have shared with me and I hope to add to your string today. Your bunch of flowers, if it will. If, it, if, it, if it's to be. In sharing this day, I offer you that reflection, true reflection on yourself, on your soul, is a life journey. It's aided best by guidance of a mentor or someone similar, a sage perhaps. It must be about being with yourself and returning there as you care for others knowing that compassion comes before empathy. You can't empathize before you have compassion. And that's sometimes the reverse of what we teach people. And with that compassion, I think will come a sense of peace with your own frailty and vulnerability that will make you much more peaceful in caring for others in their moments of frailty and vulnerability. So as I come to the end, I just want to share some of those pearls in the string, if you will. You can tell I like pearls. Um, remember that self-care is requisite. Don't forget it. Really, don't forget it. Hillary said it. Mark said it. I'm saying it again. Devote time to self-care and compassion. Here's the odd thing. You devote it to yourself, you will save time in practice. It takes no more time to deliver compassionate care than it does to deliver substandard repulsive care. And I'll tell you something. In fact, the sort of awful care that I've 
occasionally witnessed. I've been privileged to work with really fabulous people and to visit with really wonderful colleagues around the world. The bad care actually takes more time. You're too busy thinking about yourself and you're wasting time thinking about yourself when you could just be taking care of the person who needs that care. Practice deliberate reflection because again, as you care for yourself, you're going to be vastly more effective and productive. And recognize that in doing that, that independence is a myth. So that you can value the interdependence with your guides and your sages, your mentors, and that you can guide people as their nurse in a very profound way. Engage with a guide for reflection that relationship will pay big dividends. You might have more than one, but at least have someone. Be patient with yourself and with others. Try not to be your own worst, harshest critic. Treasure your vulnerability. Your vulnerability is what gives you access to be compassionate. Express empathy from a place of vulnerability and compassion for yourself. People will pick up on it. They know when you're a kind person to yourself because they'll see your kindness, your true kindness to them. And return to self-care as the means for caring for others. Have I said that enough? Did you get it? Uh, I wouldn't be a teacher if I didn't think, and perhaps this is the clinician in me too, because I get asked a lot, how do you measure compassion? Well, I'm a qualitative researcher. I don't measure anything. No, that's not true. As a clinician, I have to, really. Sorry, Hillary. Hillary's probably thinking, oh my gosh, Mark is going, whoa, wait a minute. No, I'd like you to be asking yourself, yeah, but how do I know this is really working? I mean, honestly, you're an American nurse over here for a week. What difference will it make? Well, I think a way to think about all of this talk that we've been having about compassion and how to make it real is to consider how you might make it part of you. Do you want to make it part of you? It's a, an acid question, an acid test to ask yourself. I think that these are some ways that you can think about defining the value of embodiment of self and care through connection and reflection to more fully realize compassion and empathy. You might know that you've achieved your next level of understanding when you don't have to remember, oh, I got to spend time reflecting when it becomes a habit. When your sense of well-being flourishes beyond health, when you don't have to say, yeah, I'm healthy, I wish I were a little happier and I could take a, more of those, a few more of those ADP pints. Uh, yeah, let's try to think about not getting through it but actually reflecting on it. I really appreciated Mark's sharing that because we've all been there. Now, after, for me, after night shift, it was uh, Ramos Gin Fizzes um, uh, for a time when I first became a nurse until I realized, you know what? This is not doing me any good and it's really messing up my sleep cycle. Joy is evident and so it was felt. When you can feel real joy and not joy at a nursing success, but joy at a person's success. My friend Kristen, whom I think is following the stream back home with her newborn, she's a clinical nurse specialist with whom I work, um, and I were talking about this before we left, uh, before I left via email, and she said, you know, it's really important to remember the person stuff because the healthcare successes are not enough. It's the joy of seeing the people we're caring for flourish, and I really felt that when Kristen said it. But you also need to feel the sorrow and really feel the sorrow. To cry for someone, often in private, but sometimes with your guide or sage, is a profound and important gift. Because if we can't feel the highs and the lows in balance, we won't really know that it's human life. And importantly, and this is sticking to your guns, standing up for what you know is right, and following Mark's idea that we can all do the right thing, we can all be better clinicians and be the example, that right and wrong stand out for you. If it's wrong, say it. Don't compromise. Don't capitulate and gravitate toward the average. Don't accept mediocrity. So I'm going to leave it there, and uh, um, we can look at this uh, beautiful, I think it's a magnolia, um, as we answer questions and comments.
three speakers would like to come up. Um, uh, Sarah, thank you so much. I've heard Sarah speak before, and I am looking forward to hearing Sarah again because every year she brings us really interesting thought-provoking ideas and I love her idea about self-care because I think that is so important. So as you are aware the focus of today's presentation was on humanity, compassion, spiritual concepts so I'm sure you have questions and Fiona has kindly agreed to take the mic and to bring them up and we'd, I know that the speakers would welcome your questions so please feel free to ask anything that's occurring to you. And feel free to, free to either comment or disagree if you like. I think all three of us are happy to engage in uh, a, um, a civil argument, shall we say, if uh, we've said something that doesn't quite fit for you. In fact, I'd be upset if I didn't uh, upset somebody. <laughs> Um, I, I just wanted, it's probably more a comment really, I've just been looking at some of the literature around compassion fatigue in the last few weeks and I think, you know, when you look at Joynson's original kind of term compassion fatigue in 92, I think she, what she was trying to talk about, or what I feel she was trying to talk about was the challenges that professionals sort of face when, you know, being compassionate. But I think, just looking at the literature recently, and I think, Sarah, what you said about medicalizing, it has been medicalized. Compassion fatigue has been medicalized. And I don't think that's originally what Joynson meant uh, when she talked about compassion fatigue. If, if I could just follow up on that, that I think that's a, a wonderful comment. I, I agree. I'm not terribly, uh, I haven't looked at the compassion fatigue literature um, for some time, but I do talk about it with colleagues because it is quite popular as a topic in America. Um, I worry that it's a little like pregnancy and aging, you know, uh, uh, put pregnancy or aging in into healthcare and we have to put a biomedical frame on it. Um, so too with compassion fatigue, which we often use in a clinical sense. Um, and that's, I think, a caution for all of us because uh, truthfully, in an aging world, and we live in an aging world, um, and I can talk endlessly about that, I'll spare you, but in an aging world, remember, chronic non-communicable disease, um, persistent symptoms, uh, functional challenges, not limitations, but challenges, which may be result in uh, limitations are, are part and parcel of what we do. We're rapidly, globally running into the limitation of rotation of the biomedical paradigm. And I think it's incumbent upon us as nurses to stand up and say, wait a minute, we come from the discipline of nursing, not a subdiscipline of biomedicine. Let's reframe these issues, take the problem first approach that, that Mark talked about out and start thinking about strengths, advantages, and building on strength and advantage to achieve higher levels of whatever it is, whether it's the functional ability to walk or the ability to feel more peaceful as we come to resolve our own concerns about health and wellness. Whatever it might be, let's, let's stop sort of, again, regressing toward the mean. And I'd, I'd like to add to that, and I know we've had, even last week we had a discussion, um, uh, Patricia, because I, I believe that, <clears throat> and I mentioned it earlier, I believe we should be tackling this from a positive psychology perspective. And I'm, and again, it's just a personal perspective, I'm tired of the burnout literature. Uh, I'm tired of the fatigue literature. Um, because I think if you go looking for something, you'll find it. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, I think we should be measuring, um, so the antithesis of, or, or the, the opposite of, of, um, of burnout is engagement. <clears throat> and there are lots of psychological tools out there. And um, I know uh, Sarah alluded to uh, not being a quantitative uh, uh, re uh, researcher or coming from that paradigm. I tend to like measuring things, and I do think there has got to be a measure out there for compassion. Uh, not compassion fatigue, the, uh, op you know, the other end of the spectrum, but I think if we look at flourishing, well-being, vigor, absorption, dedication, the things that you would like your carer, your nurse, your nurse to be, to give to the 
therapeutic relationship. I think we can measure those. There's lots of psychological tools out there that measure this in non-nursing, uh, from a non-nursing perspective. So I believe that we can, we can measure it. I, I do, and I'm looking at you to find that tool, Patricia. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the patient experience, I mean, um, if you look at HICWA and some of the requirements, I mean, we, and, and the HCAP in America, I mean, all of the funding streams are, go, are asking patients about their experience of the, of the care, of the interaction, of the, of the, ex, uh, of the um, intervention, nursing intervention or care intervention that they've had. So, so I have no doubt that we are going to have to look at some innovative, creative way of measuring this amongst ourselves because that's what we're being, and, and the care in this country will eventually be paid on. You're paid on, your, on the patient experience. I suppose, can I just say, having done 10 years of quantitative analysis of the patient's experience, that I would wholeheartedly say that it's fine to have the metrics, but only if the metrics measure on the ground and if they're a true reflection. And the methods that we use to gather those metrics are extremely important. And I have moved over, I suppose, slightly to one side. I love stats, don't get me wrong, and they're great when you want to win an argument um, or p you know, put forward your case or something like that. But I think we often miss something with quantitative that we can get with qualitative research. And I have recently brought patient opinion to Ireland and one of the reasons that I felt so strongly about bringing that is because it allows patients, family, friends, carers, the whole lot, staff indeed, to explore their experience using their own language, in their own way, in a way that suits them, in a time that suits them, and in a me through a mechanism that gives them safety and transparentness, which we are very short of in the ground in Ireland at the moment. And it's anonymous, so nobody's name, because you wouldn't believe how often I have heard, I won't rock the boat, I'm afraid to rock the boat. Patients often, and family members indeed, on behalf of patients, often say that, that they, what, they don't answer quantitative questions in a real and honest way because they are afraid it can be tracked back to them and that somehow that's going to have a negative implication for them. Now the reality is that that doesn't happen, but it doesn't take the fear away. And so when you are doing your research, as I'm sure all of you will have to do some, you know, I say to you this, I have always had one rule about research, don't do it to sit on a shelf. Do it because it's something you're passionate about, because you believe that it's going to make a difference. It doesn't matter if it's something very small, but know that, that what you're doing is, is going to make you, is, is good for you or is good for somebody else that you're encountering. And we need to look at different methods. And I, I was that soldier, you know, there was no question on our questionnaire that didn't have an evidence background, you couldn't put it on. If, we, if I couldn't see it written in the literature, it was not going on my questionnaire. So I, I say to you that I, I've been there and I have now moved over to this side and I just say we lose so much by dictating the questions. And if you're going to do a, a, a quantitative piece like that, then get the patients and the carers and the family members to frame the questions, because you might get a very different response. And I'll just say that is community-based participatory mixed methods research that you've just heard Mark <laughs> and Hillary articulate, just have to be the research methods teacher here. It's a really good thing to think about merging the paradigms. For those of you who will do research. Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm supposed to be a researcher by trade, but you see, I'm not that good. <laughs> I, I've just been doing a lot longer. <laughs> I'm just wondering would it be true to say that compassion can be a, a lonely road in some ways. Um, and I, I can imagine if it's very, as well, somebody said here, it's very individual as well. Um, that it's not an organizational thing, but it's a decision you make to be 
not only a decision, but it's in her, it's within your heart, I suppose, to be compassionate. But I'm just thinking it could be a lonely road for, for a professional. Um, and I'm just thinking of the value also of, say, um, you know, that uh, professionals need to um, bring people under their wing as well and sort of have a sort of a compassionate uh, clan around them. Maybe that would be um, their own colleagues or uh, patients, families, just to have a sense that they're not, that there's, you know, it's inter sort of an interdependency thing, really. I don't know if you get what I'm trying to say, but I mean, it's just a comment, really. Yeah. We probably all have something to say. Yeah. Yeah. Hillary, do you want to go first? Uh, go we'll first. go in turn. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, yeah, I think, yes, I'm, you know, I have feel I'm very fortunate to have met Mary Prendergast a long, long time ago. And I often think that in Ireland she possibly is somebody who has walked a very lonely path initially. And it is through strength and perseverance that she has kept going. But I would say that it might be lonely, but the benefits of it are so rewarding, and the people that you meet on that pathway enhance your life. So it might be lonely to begin with, but actually, you know, it stops being lonely pretty sh soon, and, you know, you meet great people. And I think that's the thing, because like will c come to like. You know, we attract equal the, as we are, I suppose. So. Thank you, Hilary. Um, so my middle name is Hope, and I tell my patients I really try to live up to it. I tend to be a very positive person. I think compassion is only as lonely as the questions you have about expressing it. Um, once you begin to really live and believe in compassion, empathy, and care, and integrate the science into it, integrate um, the, the make, reframe biomedicine in it, um, that's the only time you're lonely because I find truly that people are hungry for the opportunity to recognize each other's humanity. And so the minute, and I don't know if you saw, but the minute you made that comment, Mark and I looked at each other like, yeah, it is that loneliness that Hillary described that she and Mary and, and Mark and I have all had for a moment until we really stand up and proclaim, no, this is what it's about. I'm not entertaining other questions because if you entertain the idea that compassion is optional, then you're not actually providing health care. You're providing procedures or therapeutics, but not actual health care. Because there's no way anybody can be healthy. You can have the absence of disease or injury without compassion, I suppose. Maybe we could have a debate about that. But you cannot have health, and you certainly can't have well-being without compassion, and that means you have to find the person in the people who are wearing those roles of clinician or patient. Yeah, and I think it's a, a really great question. Mm -hmm. I really do, um, I, and I think you've hit the nail on the head because I think you run the risk of isolating yourself initially, mm -hmm. but I would say my own experience in practice, and, and, and I haven't practiced for for a long time, but my own experience in practice is that it's infectious. Mm -hmm. So, um, is, is that it doesn't take long uh, for a lot of people to realize that you're a shining light and that you, the way you practice as an individual and as a professional is a whole lot better and different than everyone else on that unit. Or, and in my own experience, um, it's neonatal intensive care um, and midwifery and um, it gets to the stage where it becomes a little bit embarrassing when the women are asking for you. Um, uh, That's awesome. Or the mums uh, of the babies, who's looking after my kid today? Uh, or where's Mark? Where's Mary? Where's, you know? Yes. So, so it becomes slightly infectious, but it is isolated, and that's why it's really important, the messages that Sarah gave about self-care. Because you need to have you need to have other outlets, because don't expect your colleagues to rally around and say, uh, you're, you're a great uh, nurse, you're a great professional. The reward comes in the 
um, patient interaction and the, 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 um, uh, that therapeutic relationship with your patient, that's where the reward comes. It doesn't come from claps on the back or uh, um, people uh, saying, aren't you a great nurse? But it will come from the undergrads who you mentor. Because remember I said what you permit, you promote. And the students, and I'm sure people here have stories themselves, they know who the nurses are that are, and mentors are, that are kind, compassionate, caring, empathetic, all of those things. They know who they are, the same as I did when I was a student 25 years ago. I knew who they were, and I knew, the, I knew by the patients when I came on shift who they had the previous shift by, their, by the state of the patients. I knew who they were. So I, as a student, drifted towards the kind, empathetic, compassionate uh, people, and I think that, the, uh, and I think that's the same uh, today. So to answer your question, it is isolating, at, uh, you know, initially uh, for you to, to 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 stand up. But there are so many wins and so many rewards by practicing and in that way. And you you hit the nail on the head. It's a personal choice. Mm -hmm. to, it's just a personal choice. It doesn't matter what environment you work in. And I listed the list of things that are wrong with nursing here in Ireland at the start. It doesn't really matter about those things. Whether you're kind, considerate, caring, compassionate to the person that you're dealing with is a personal choice. It doesn't matter what's going on in the context around. It doesn't matter if you're in a war zone. You, it doesn't matter if you've just you know, witnessed people being killed in front of you. How you act, and I think Viktor Frankl talks about it, a lot of that, yeah. how you act is, is, is entirely up to you. You can, make the, you can choose, you can make that decision. And I will say, just to follow up, because war zone makes me think of it, Mark, is I don't know about Irish nurses, but American nurses can be extremely harsh toward one another. Um, you know, they, they act like they're kind, considerate, and compassionate when they're with the client or patient, but they're just cutting each other up sometimes. Um, uh, it, I don't think it's ubiquitous by any stretch of the imagination. I'd actually say a small fraction of us do it, but we all know it happens. The phrase we use is eating our young. Um, and I'll just say, you have to live it. It can't be, oh, I do it with patients, but I'm just the, the tough nut when it comes to my colleagues. We have to be kind, considerate, and compassionate toward ourselves, toward our colleagues, and toward those people who, for that time, are our patients. And there but by the grace of God go we. These roles turn around in the stroke of a moment. Hi, my name is Luda. I meant to ask a question. You know the way you're saying compassionate and empathy and we all have it. One way or another, we all have it. And we wouldn't be here in this profession if we didn't in the first place. But how come in the medical profession in these countries you support quality and these elements aren't the pillars? of that quality standard in the first place. And wouldn't that be better if it was supported from the head down, really, you know, from the management perspective? And that would be the main view. I think I grasp your question. I yeah. think. Can I, I, can I just say, yesterday I asked a very similar question yeah, of kill Tony O'Brien Kill yesterday. the dragon by the, by the hate, you yeah. know? Um, Tony O'Brien, as you know, is the de director general of the HSE, and he he opened the conference yesterday. And I asked a very similar question. Um, I suppose I have two hats, if you want to put it that way. I, I run the Irish Society for quality and safety in healthcare, and also then for patient opinion. And I asked him yesterday if we had moved too far towards safety and quality measures and if we had lost something in terms of humanity and compassion in doing that. And I, I think, this is, and this is my personal belief, that we have become very focused on things like the checklist, which we definitely need to ensure the, that we provide good quality services. And we 100% need to know that we have done the best we can to safeguard the patient and ensure that they have a, you know, a good outcome. But 
there is a part of that that makes me concerned that we have gone so far into form-filling procedures, policies and protocols that we have lost out in one of the most valuable things that we have, which is time and time at the bedside. And he did agree yesterday that he felt the pendulum had gone too far over and that now it needed to shift back. And I think that that is a reasonable statement and I, I would hope that he would, he would embrace that and try to see that there is a need to have a very balance, as in all things in life we should have balance. Um, we have to have the proper policies and procedures and protocols, but we don't need to be filling in forms for the rest of our life, and we certainly need to be making sure that we give the patient not just the clinical care that they need, but also the time to heal, because after all, they're sick. Um, I just sort of want to add to that, that I don't think that this is a specifically Irish challenge. I think that part of the, the problem exists, and in this case I'm using the word problem intentionally, is that we've developed a framework, the biomedical paradigm, in which um, we've really elevated um, evidence and a particular type of evidence from science to such a level that it's very difficult where to figure out um, and how to figure out the placement of human values, um, in part because if when we're talking about health care, we're really talking about illness and injury care. And this is the challenge whether we're looking at palliative care, end of life care, um, even primary care, because primary care is at a distinct disadvantage in some ways, because the challenge that we see in a extension of biomedical paradigm into healthcare operations is that you generally only get the term patient when you're ill or injured or at the end of your life and because we've medicalized pregnancy when you're about to deliver an infant. Um, but here's something really to consider is how are we using the language of person, health, and wellness over and above illness, injury, and everything that comes with that? Uh, so this is, I think, not just an Irish problem, but it is a rather global problem, particularly for high-income nations where our challenges are living well with chronic or persistent conditions. I, ju I just wanted to say that um, from yesterday's conference, from a lot of the work that I've, the journey that I'm on myself, there's one of the things that sticks out in my mind and that is if if we can give care in a mindful way we sometimes stand at the bedside I think with split attention and if we can just stay in the zone stay with you know the person that's in front of us I know we talk a lot about person-centered care um, I believe that when you stay in that zone, you, you don't hear anything else that's going on around you. So that if the phone is ringing, you don't drop the patient and run to the phone. You don't wonder what's happening to the lady next door unless she's really collapsing. So I think that in order to be compassionate, we have to be mindful and stay in a mindful zone. Um, I don't know if I'm getting that no, right. And, 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 no, and move away from split attention. I stay think you're I think you're right, and it's something that I probably would have struggled with as a nurse, not, not just a nurse, but as, as a man, because we're talking about multitasking here. Um, and uh, it's something I struggle with at home. You know, so I, can, I hear all the news, but it's kind of gone over my head as I'm going through today's post when I come in, you know, and I'm looking at the bills, and I hear what the kids are saying about their day, but am I in the zone and listening, or am I just asking the questions for the sake of asking the questions? And the same I could say and reflect back in terms of my practice. So I asked all the questions, how are you today? You know, did you have a good night's sleep? Am I really listening to, to the answers, or am I going through the checklists, um, which, uh, w w which we've all been? So I think you're, you're, you're dead. There's a little bit of an art and a skill to that. And that brings me back to the previous person because I've been mulling over in my head and I've had these thoughts before about maybe three years ago <clears throat> with Mary and wondering if we could ever develop, because we're all into competencies, 
if we could ever develop a competency of compassion, but then that doesn't fit with the biomedical model, which really, do they acknowledge compassion or do they just acknowledge the problem and solution? So, um, uh, uh, but I, I do think it's something that we, well, we, we're here today, we're having those conversations that we need to uh, reflect on, Katrina. It, I don't think it's easy giving yourself wholly in an acute unit, um, even in a busy residential unit, um, it's not an easy thing and it's a it's something that maybe comes with years when you're practicing for years because I know when you're a, when you when you're a novice and you're a student or you're a graduate you're trying to tick all the boxes make sure that the patients are not falling out of the bed next door and doing stuff so it might come with experience but I really like the the notion uh, of being mindful Katrina I think it's a really good one that no matter what we go to do, if we stay with it, like even if it's just doing the blood pressure, do it mindfully. Stay with it, you know. And just for that moment, I think you can transfer without it, maybe saying anything to the patient. I don't mean not yeah. telling them what you're going to do, but just transfer that, that empathy, that compassion with being with them. Yeah, and I, I don't. You know, I was really taken by the my, my my time in Royal Salford, and I can't overemphasize yeah. the importance of not having electronic monitoring uh, for your routine kind of patients on the ward. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> for some of the younger nurses here, they may well have never held a hand, felt a felt a sweaty palm, felt a cold, almost collapsing hand. Um, because all we ever do is push the button and walk away and come back 30 seconds later and our obs are there. But, you know, so the importance, and I think the, the, um, the, the uh, Royal Salford experience for me is that <clears throat> there's a lot to be said by being with the patient Katrina, sitting by the bedside, taking three minutes out, four minutes out to do observations, to sit, to talk, to feel, to touch. Mm -hmm. I mean, to touch. Can I, I really want to emphasize what Mark is saying because I think we're all seduced by the uh, allure of electronic technology. It's a sham in many ways because the time it takes to put the Dynamap on, press the button, distract yourself with something else, come back, think about whether that's an accurate reading if you're that invested in it, and then write it down means that everything else you could have accomplished by taking the blood pressure and pulse manually, checking apical and radial, and at the same time, as you point out, assessing skin tone, texture, diaphoresis, heat and cold, or Response. temperature, sorry, whatever I'm talking about here, I've lost my uh, mind right there, but and the, the actual verbal response, response of the yeah. individual and ability to engage means you've just saved yourself a ton of time by being mindful or in other philosophical frames we would call it embodied comportment. That is, if you are fully embodied and using yourself as the tool rather than grabbing a, an external tool, all of a sudden, your integration of qualitative and quantitative, just had to come back to that, becomes vastly more profound and incredibly more effective. And we have a lot of science that points to that, so I'm not just pulling that out of thin air. We'll take one more question and then we'll, yes. we'll draw to a close. Thank you. Just a comment. Um, I agree that um, compassion is a personal choice. Um, but I suppose just coming back to, to, I suppose, all the other challenges that, that are there and I suppose as part of our, our own self-care, um, I think that there is a limit to, to that and that as part of our self-care with all the other stuff that's going on, I think that we have to acknowledge the impact of that as well. Might I ask you just to explain a little bit more about what you think that, that limit is, particularly in relation to self-care? Because I think I understand, but I'd like to know more. Yeah, I think it's, it's about, you know, I suppose all the other um, the challenges of um, resources and so on that... Ah, um, uh, okay, yeah, systems issues. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's very true. We all live in a world, um, particularly in a, a recession and post-recession era, I think we live in uh, worlds of painfully constrained resources. But here's something um, I, I find worth 
my time. And so I just say this as a practicing clinician, um, uh, and I offer it to you, and that is for everyone. Um, where's the waste? Uh, I find that there's a lot of stuff that we do either ritualistically or because the system sort of mandates it and we don't question it. I think there's a lot of waste in what we do um, because we sort of never get around to thinking, but what does that get us? What's the, what's the value there? And I would encourage all nurses to become much more active, engaged system critics and evaluators so that we don't stand for waste and we also don't engage in waste ourselves. That gives us more time in lots of ways. And my favorite example of that is acute in, in, in acute inpatient care, um, delirium management. Commonly, I find nurses wasting a ton of time and resources sort of trying to put the Band-Aid on the delirious patient, like, no, no, I'm going to control you, rather than and using the science and therapeutic relationship that in fact can turn things around vastly more quickly and with a lot less waste. So I definitely hear you because we've been looking at cost containment. I mean, honestly, American length of stay in acute care is down to the point of hello and goodbye uh, with a couple of tests in between sometimes. So we're really focused on transitional care. But what that's got me to think about is, OK, this is what I've got. How much can I make of it? Because I feel that constrainment that you were, to which you refer. Thank you. Yeah, and, I, and I'd like to say, because I alluded to it in, in, in my talk, I think the key word you use there is acknowledge. So acknowledging it is one thing. Accepting it is another. Um, and I think that. Because you, 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 like this stuff goes on. It's a personal choice, as you said. It's a personal choice. The best analogy I can give is with my, with my kids or my loved ones or my partner is I can use all the excuses in this, under the sun for being a cranky old git uh, when, I, when I come home. But that's the, I, I, I can use them. But that's not acceptable. That's not acceptable for the tone that I use. That's not acceptable for the sharpness that I use. And I have a really... Um, a bright little seven-year-old girl, and uh, she, she always says, uh, and she's quite articulate, she says, I don't like the way you said that. And when she says that, I just go, well, uh, you know, she's dead right. I said that, she said, you've spoken to me sharply. And I'm thinking, oh. <laughs> you know, uh, if my, if, could you imagine if patients were honest and said that to us, you know? Uh, so, so I think you're right, acknowledging it's busy, there's resource issues. There's a lot of stuff, of stuff going on, um, but acknowledging it and not accepting it for the reason or giving uh, gi given this th for the reason for below par interactions, below par therapeutic interventions, below par nursing interventions. I think that's the thing. Acknowledging, yeah, I'm busy. I'm short. We're short today, but that shouldn't be the reason for you being sh or and it, not you, but but for people anyway. being sharp or providing below par uh, uh, interactions. Just to, um, you, what you were saying about communication is interesting. The All Ireland thing for uh, palliative care for the people dying, the first study that was done there, um, what came out of that and re communication in patients' opinion, it wasn't the quality, it's like the patients know that we're under resourced and we're over busy, but it wasn't the quality or the quantity of communication, it was the quality. Is what's important okay. to the patient. Yeah. It's kind of what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And it's not necessarily as you say, what you say, it's how you say it, isn't it? Yeah. So now, as we draw the master class to a close, I want to say a very big thank you to all of our speakers, to Mark, to Sarah, and to Hilary, because we've all really enjoyed your talks, really, really learned from them and benefited from them. And I'd like to take this opportunity as well to thank Mary Prendergast, so if Mary wouldn't mind standing up, because Mary was the instigator of this masterclass. And Mary is very shy and bashful, but she is a, a powerhouse of energy. And she is so, as, as one of the speakers, I think it was Hilary referred to, Mary really has driven compassion.
want to thank you all for your attention and for your thought-provoking questions, and I hope that you all enjoyed it as much as I did. So thank you all. Thank you.